Dzień dobry. Good morning. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about bots and bodies is the title of my, my presentation. And that's the blending of technology, RPA, uh, artificial intelligence, and also the best of human uh, endeavor um, using human intelligence. Um, uh, I'm Andrew Whalen. I'm the CTO at Alexander Mann Solutions. Alexander Mann delivers uh, exquisite uh, total talent solutions to a number of blue chip clients around the world. Uh, we focus on all of the processes around recruitment and we become you, our clients, when we deliver that solution and we're very proud about the solution that we deliver. Um, we have two big centers in Poland, in Krakow and Gdańsk, and actually a lot of the expertise around robotics and AI have been built up, particularly in those centers. So uh, I'm very proud of all of the achievements that the team have done. So this is a bit about me. Uh, my, my background is very much in uh, working in technology. I started off as an accountant, but that teaches you about data and number flows and all that kind of stuff. And then I moved, uh, I worked at PwC for 10 years, and then I worked in FTSE and NASDAQ listed staffing companies over the last 10 years and joined Alexander Mann Solutions in 2015. So, through this uh, presentation, I want to get really practical. So I'll teach you a bit about how artificial intelligence really works so that then you can use it in your business situation. Uh, I'll talk about robotic process automation and how we've applied it in our shared service centers. And then um, I'll give you a flavor of how you've got some real power in the data that you have. So you probably get lots of people coming to talk to you about artificial intelligence and telling you, uh, that they're going to sell you a, an amazing product and what value you have uh, to add to that. Uh, and I'll give you lots of really good examples around how we've applied it. So the first example I want to talk about is, um, I want to talk about um, all the headlines that we're seeing around artificial intelligence. Uh, and you see this in newspapers. And you, if you pick out the top one there about the, um, uh, the Uber driver, or they were testing out uh, some artificial intelligence driving the car, uh, and uh, the BBC put the, the, web, uh, the video of the, uh, the, the driver driving along and then running over somebody. Um, and I looked and looked and looked, and I'm pretty sure that I would never have avoided running over that person. Now, maybe that says something bad about me, but um, I I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have been the case. What I was looking for with robotics was something that would assemble my um, IKEA furniture and things like that, because I'm particularly bad at that. However, the really key point that I want to pick out on here is, is the point by uh, Andrew Nguyen, who says that artificial intelligence is the new electricity. And what he's really saying here is that when the Industrial Revolution came, it started off building on steam power. And then all of a sudden, electricity started to be provided. So you didn't have to bring coal in and all of those kinds of things. Suddenly, there was electricity. And that made a huge boost in productivity. And he thinks, and he's one of the kind of leading people in artificial intelligence. He's a professor at Stanford. He thinks that it will have the same impact on business. So to give you a real example and help you to make some decisions around how you can apply uh, artificial intelligence in your businesses, um, I'm going to talk a bit about something called AlphaGo. So AlphaGo was a, an experiment to demonstrate what artificial intelligence could really do, built by Google um, uh, to play Go, which is a game which is played particularly in Korea, and it's much more complicated than chess. Uh, and what they did was they built it by learning off of lots of other different uh, people, looking at the, the best experts, and then they ran it against the European champion back in 2015. And uh, it beat it, it, it the AlphaGo beat the European champion 5-0. But that wasn't really a test. The real test was to play against a guy called Lee Sidol, who was the recognized master of Go. And uh, they, they played Lee Sedol in 2016, and it beat him 4-1, which is actually pretty impressive. I was impressed that uh, Lee Sedol was able to beat it in one of the games. And afterwards, he was asked, what did you think? How did you think AlphaGo performed? Uh, and his response was, it was beautiful. It saw things that I didn't see. The really interesting part of this story is the next slide, because... What they did next was they built AlphaGo Zero, and they did this in a completely different way. They took uh, the rules of Go, and they programmed it into the computer, and then they put it on a supercomputer, and they ran for three days, and it just simulated. It played itself. 
just with the rules. It didn't look at any kind of human uh, examples or anything, just learned. And then they took AlphaGo Zero and they played it against AlphaGo. And it beat it 100 nil. That's after three days of work, which I think is part of the reason why people are starting to think about something called the AI singularity. And this is the kind of scare story that goes out, which says that we're going to be taken over and Skynet is coming. And the real kind of cr uh, crux of this is this model where the improvement of artificial intelligence happens to a point where the AI is able to design itself. And the design process for an AI would be so much quicker than ours that it would accelerate away and then we would not understand what we had. I personally don't think that this will come. And uh, I think it's because we're assuming that there's a whole general intelligence uh, that isn't actually there at the moment. The other thing that I think will limit this is, um, is uh, around data and power. And we'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But firstly, I want to explain what is the reason why all of this artificial intelligence is exploding at the moment and it's becoming really hot and everybody feels they need to move into it. It's a combination of two things. Firstly, that we have a huge amount of data at the moment. We measure data now in zettabytes, which is 10 to the power of 21, which is amazing. Um, I reflect back on my first computer that I had, uh, which I built myself, which had one megabyte of data, so 10 to the power of 6. Um, now, uh, I, when I worked at PwC in 2005, we had a whole program where we had to back up all of the data across all of the, the systems in the UK, and we were backing up one terabyte. Um, my daughter has a, um, a data allowance, because I'm a very indulgent father, of 40 gigabytes a month, which is, yeah, for me, seems, seems ridiculous, although she seems to hit the barrier quite a bit. Um, and now we're, uh, in 2010, we had... Uh, one zettabyte of data globally, and by 2020, we will have uh, over 30 zettabytes of data. So it doubles pretty much every year, which is why we can feed all that data into our AI uh, products and they can learn. The other thing that's happening is that computing is becoming much more ubiquitous. So we have got access to huge amounts of cloud computing. I constantly get contacted by Google, uh, and by uh, Microsoft and Amazon offering me different prices on power and cooling and, and processing and lots of u utilities which all make me spend money with them. And recently, um, uh, I, I was looking at the fact that Google is one of the largest kit manufacturers in the world, which blew my mind. I thought it was just a you know, search engine tool with a whole bunch of interesting products that surrounded that. But actually, they produce a lot of kit because they build data centers next to hydroelectric power stations, and they have very specific needs. The other thing um, that I found out recently was uh, that Facebook build their own clean rooms because they have to build their own chips to support their processing, which, again, is an incredible thing. You don't think of Facebook as building chips. However, and there's a warning here on the side around um, uh, all of this power and capability is not going to be infinite. It's not going to keep on growing and growing. And at some point, there will be uh, a point where we say, OK, we're, we're hitting the limits. And I'll give you a great example of that. Um, I, everybody knows about Bitcoin, but part of the process of Bitcoin is Bitcoin mining, which is multiplying huge prime numbers together and actually uses a lot of processing power, uses a lot of um, uh, energy to do that. And we're currently at the stage where all the Bitcoin mining going on in the world is having quite a big impact. It uses the same energy as the country of Ireland. And power stations in Iceland are now heavily into providing power for Bitcoin miners. Um, and if we take that forward, I know this is a bit of a projection, but if we take this growth forward and it doubles every four months, Around the kind of start of 2020, it's going to have a serious impact on the power drain globally, which can't be environmentally right. It, it, there must be at some point where we say, OK, this is, oh, we find a different way to do this processing. It can't be right. So there are clear limitations on unlimited processing power and keeping all of this data. Recently, we've seen a lot of changes around GDPR as well, and that includes the right not to be assessed automatically. So we've got to build that into our solutions as well. One other thing that I wanted to pick up was what AI can really do to be really practical. So Andrew Nguyen uh, 
has a great tweet that um, this is the guy that I mentioned before, the professor at Stanford. He says that uh, AI can do pretty much anything that a normal person can do in, in one second. What that means is it's that judgment, it's that sense of what do I think the answer is, um, and using your experience. An example I will give in recruitment, for, uh, which is the field that I work in, obviously, is looking at a CV, you can make a judgment in about seven seconds is what most really experienced recruiters will say, is this person right for this job? And they may be making seven separate one-second judgments across the CV. So maybe I can train an AI to do that, and we actually are working on that exact thing. Very quickly, I want to explain how we train AI. So there are kind of three methods, one of which, the first one, which is um, supervised learning, actually generates about 99% of the economic value at the moment going on. Um, and what that involves is feeding the AI a, uh, a list of data, inputs and outputs. So an example might be, here's a bunch of text files mapped to some sound files. And then the AI can work through that and learn to map well, first the inputs to the outputs. So then it becomes able to translate either way. So to translate text into sound or sound into text. The same with translations as well. But you need a lot of data and a lot of processing power. The second method is unsupervised learning, which is not used so much at the moment, but it looks across a bunch of data and looks for patterns. It categorizes the data. It doesn't understand what the data is, but it can work out patterns and look at it. So a good example is how Google looked through a bunch of videos and found cats. Incredibly useful. Um, but it was that, it's that kind of thing that you're teaching the AI to spot things and patterns across the data. And the last one uh, is um, reinforcement learning, which is how the AlphaGo Zero example that I gave earlier on worked. So that's building a set of rules and then running simulations and working out the best results. So you know, the key point here is you need a lot of data to do this kind of thing. Uh, and that when we develop an AI product, going back to that point that Andrew Nung said, any, you can do anything that a human can do in about a second using their judgment. Um, think about the AI people that come to you and they say, we can work with your data and we can create, we can, we've got a product that can make, help make decisions to replace people doing those kind of one second judgment things. They're going to use their, your data to improve their product. So a good example for us is we use it for looking at uh, a CV or a resume and then looking at how, which of those CVs is most likely to get the job, or most likely, more interestingly, to be a high performer in that job. So uh, we have all of that history and that knowledge. So when someone comes to us and says, let's use your RAI tool, they're improving it. And I think that you need to think about what kind of stake you have in the game with that person, whether there's a commercial advantage, especially if you're at the early stages, to work with them and partner with them and share the IP. Now I'm going to switch from artificial intelligence to robotics, which is somewhat different. It's not highly intelligent. Um, it's more scripted. It's like some of the macros of old. Uh, and we use it in um, uh, talent acquisition processes to pick out those really kind of dull things that we can automate. They're administrative. They're predictable. They're repetitive. Uh, and this allows us to start bringing time saving, it allows us to enhance the whole candidate experience because you know probably a lot of you, when you're applying for a job and you get no response straight away, uh, that can feel like the service that the company is offering you is not good, especially as you might be a customer of that company as well as a person that's applying for the job. So we use it to drive accuracy, uh, to drive out things like bias. So uh, we will get the robot to uh, make simple decisions and make sure people throw through a process, whereas you can actually train an artificial intelligence tool to be just as biased if you use the data set with the bias built in. So we use this quite a lot to pro, uh, automate a whole bunch of our administrative processes. Uh, and why this works for us particularly is that we are offering our recruitment process outsourcing processes across really big blue chip companies, but we centralize that in a lot of our processing centers. So as I mentioned, we've got one in Gdansk and one in uh, Krakow, plus the others on the screen. Um, 
And that means I can see those processes operating in a centralized way. I can see the 25,000, sorry, 250,000 interviews that we schedule every year. And then we can use automation to bring the best of breed processes to really drive those and get them uh, a lot better. Uh, and we have lots of scale as well, which allows us to really look at the best of breed. Um, so what can the uh, robot process. So it can do a whole bunch of things around um, using applications the same way a person does. So um, the best way to describe it is I work with um, uh, lots of different client applications, which are all Windows-based or uh, web-based. And the robot can be trained to use the user interface. Um, I always have to point out to people there's no actual robot sitting on a seat anywhere. I've and there's no shiny metal or anything like that, which is, I know you guys get that, but sometimes it has to be pointed out. But the robot is able to feel where the fields are, feel the buttons, press the buttons. Doesn't work too well through Citrix, because that's really difficult, because it can't feel. You have to work by coordinates through Citrix. But through applications, it can learn to operate those applications. And that means it can do things like um, swivel chair tasks, where you're keying in one system, keying in another. It can drive workflows, it can check and chase things, which is incredibly powerful. And those are all the kinds of things that you probably wouldn't want to do as part of your job. You want to apply your judgment in other areas and do more interesting things. Um, the kinds of processes that, um, uh, that we found are most applicable uh, in, in our field are things that require quite a lot of complexity and um, like creating offer letters, um, like, like the interview process, which I'll come to in a minute, um, where there's lots of complexity in creating assets and there's lots of rules. And the robot follow those really well, whereas people quite often won't have the, the same kind of focus on quality. So we apply it across all of these different uh, processes across our organization to really drive efficiency. So I want to jump into a real case study now. So. Um, uh, back in 2015, we had a task where we were taking over and running a new client, and we had to download 70,000 documents from a, um, a big system which had a whole bunch of information about candidates, and then to organize them into SharePoint folders. And we had to create separate security for each SharePoint folder, name the folder based on the candidate information. So, you know, it's a pretty boring, boring job, but somebody had to do it, and we were, we were going to get paid for it. So... Our first plan, and this is what we would always normally do, would be to find 10 people, usually not volunteers uh, in this case, uh, and allow 10 working weeks for them to process through this, this job. And it would cost about $35,000 to do that work. Um, and we'd have to manage all of the issues around staffing, and uh, they were bored, and they weren't off sick, and we'd have to have checkers to check the quality and weed out any mistakes. So not a great job. So we decided to do it differently. Um, enter Doris. Now, the reason why Doris is up there is because every single robot that we've created in Alexander Man are, uh, has its own name, usually to do with the process that they're operating, and also to do with the fact that we, we, we have an avatar for them all, so that if you ask anybody in Alexander Man, they can tell Doris's story. And then we did that with every other robotic process as well. And it sounds quite cutesy, but actually it's created a huge energy and innovation in the organization, which I think is, is really kind of key to our success. So we freed up some subject matter experts, people that understood this process. Um, we allowed a reasonable time for development, which in this case was about three months because we were learning. However, we could build Doris now, we think, in one to two weeks. And then we allowed the robot to run. So this was kind of a pivotal point for us. So we'd started it on a Friday evening, uh, and the idea was to watch it running over the next few weeks and monitor the speed and look at how much disk space it used and process it there and, and learn as much as we could. Uh, and I got a phone call from the sysadmin team on Sunday afternoon saying, your robot's broken, so, which was a bit upsetting. So we dialed in and had a look. And we found that Doris had actually finished. Uh, and Doris had done it in 36 hours, not a few weeks. And uh, there was a kind of penny drop moment, aha moment, when we thought, actually, this is pretty cool. Now, in actual fact, this was a perfect job for a robot, so actually it was a really good one to do first off. But the impact was incredible on our whole organization. Everybody was thinking, wow, what could we do next? So we did. Uh, we came up with all of these robots. 
So these are just a few of the robots that we have internally. Uh, Doris was our first one. Esme and Sasha do a whole bunch of work around contingent and um, uh, they do uh, onboarding of candidates and screening and digital signature processes. Eric is a really interesting one. So Eric works with all of our, um, our clients and logs into all of their separate systems, has his own user account, downloads a bunch of data and creates reports. Now, uh, once a month, we had somebody whose job was three or four days a week, uh, three or four days at the end of the month, would go through and do all this activity and create the report and then send it out for everybody to look at how we'd done. When we set Eric up, we thought, great, we've saved four or five days of somebody's time doing something boring, they can do something else. And then we realized we could run Eric every day, or we could run Eric whenever we wanted to. So we could have the information straight away uh, that we needed to, do, to, do, to deliver the services. So this, there's all sorts of things that happen with automation that suddenly mean that you get better quality information, the service you provide is better. Um, which brings me to Isaac. So Isaac is our interview scheduling robot. Um, and when I mean interview scheduling, I don't mean putting a calendar entry in someone's diary. I mean taking the short list of candidates and then taking them through the whole process through to maybe they're successful in the interview, giving them all the information that they need, giving them all the, um, uh, the, uh, the company song, for example, the website where the client is, the bio of the people that are going to be hiring them, all of that on a mobile device so they can arrange all of the different elements, the, the address of the coffee shop nearby where they can sit uh, just before the interview, and even possibly things like um, uh, booking a car parking space and arranging all the security. So we offer that as an end-to-end -end service. As I said, 250,000 interviews a year. And we turn that into a robotic process with people able to step in and make any of the kind of like special decisions that you might need. So we have one client that um, cancels 10% of interviews one hour before the interview, which means the candidate is kind of there already. That requires a person to step in. So we offer this as a blended solution of interview scheduling at a huge scale, and the experience is exquisite. We're also working on artificial intelligence bots that do that filtering of CVs down to the kind of like the final shortlist using the data and a lot of the information that we've already kind of built up. We have an artificial intelligence chatbot that handles queries and questions because. When people engage and ask questions on an interview, they're worried that that's part of the interview. It gives an impression about them, but they're more than happy to chat to our chatbot because they know it doesn't impact on or give any impression. Uh, and, and they can do it 24 by 7 as well, and it reduces a lot of the cost on delivering that service. And we also do onboarding and checking and chasing, which is all part of our kind of operations. So, these are just a few of the examples of using robotics and AI within talent acquisition that we think have really made a difference to the service that we offer and we think more and more will be part of our bots and bodies strategy. So what have we learned through all of this experience? Uh, I think key, five key elements uh, that I would share with you. First of all is uh, learn how to spot the right kind of process that you can automate or that you can get the data to train an AI. Um, and you have to get, have a go at that. Um, I think it's important to demonstrate some value on something small first. So we set up a robot. We took a kind of risk and we had a go. Uh, and we tried it out and we had that Doris experience, which really create, catapulted the whole kind of senior exec was really interested in everything that we're doing. We told a great story around that. Um, we built some technical capability internally to execute. Now, it's easy. Well, you know, we started off talking to consultancies and there were some big numbers thrown around, but we really wanted to get our hands dirty. And I think you have to have a go. So we created a little startup uh, in our Krakow office, and that's been the kernel for all of the other ideas that have come out. Um, I think also get your people excited. So I would uh, really encourage some kind of branding. You don't have to, this is all internal branding to us to a certain extent, although we do share it with our clients. But it was for our people to get them excited. And every day I get a phone call from somebody saying, I've got a great idea for a robot. His name's Sid, and he looks like this. Now you've got to do all the technology to make it work, which is, um, I don't mind, it's a fun bit. And then lastly, after you've done all of that maverick stuff, you have to build a center of excellence, put some processes and governance around it so that then you can start moving forward in a controlled way with all the security, 
applying GDPR appropriately and using the right technologies that will scale up. Okay, so that's the end of my Alexander Mann story in robotics and artificial intelligence. Thank you very much.